at AIA Australia. We're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards. Like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, contact your AIA CDM today. Portfolios have been with Andy for uh, three years now. Uh, Portfolios was born out of Santi's frustration with uh, the traditional advisors. Advice. Um, and there's made a point of going around the world uh, every every year to have a look and understand what's going on uh, globally, I guess, and, and bringing back uh, best best of breed. Um, uh, now working with 75 practices across the country, running uh, uh, north of half a billion now, so 520 million. Um, and we've invited him along to, to sort of share some of his uh, tricks and tips over, over the years. Thank you very much, Santi. Uh, pleasure, Ray. Great to be here and you know, congratulations to you guys at what you're building there at XY. It's uh, fantastic. No, thank you, mate. Appreciate uh, your, your continued support. Um, so, uh, one thing I hope to enjoy Santi not by uh, calling a spade. <laughs> um, in, the, in the description of this, we, we sort of suggested that egos or advisors' egos can sometimes get in the way of their success. Um, so I thought I might start in asking you to elaborate uh, in, uh, to that end, I guess. Yeah, okay, mate. I'm actually having a little bit of trouble hearing you fully, but I think I got the question. Is, is everything else working on your end? Yes. Yeah, we your internet's struggling a little bit, Ray J, so um, maybe try and fix that up. Um, see how we go. But if you got the uh, questions, Nancy, no. Uh, I think I got the question, which was really about um, was it was it something about the journey and and you know really trying to check the egos at the door. Totally. Okay. Well, look. I, look briefly for those who don't know me, uh, started in the industry. God help me. I think eighteen years ago now. So, uh, though I feel very young, it's scary when you consider eighteen years in an industry and um, at a university in ninety eight. Uh, you can all hear me okay still, yeah? Yeah, you're all good, Santi. Yeah, great. So uh, finished out of uni, 98, joined the industry straight out uh, as a power plant, I guess you could call it, and uh, really um, started to question a whole bunch of things quite immediately. Uh, I was probably a little bit different from, uh, you know, you, you guys that I was trained by the old school, uh, by the old salesman, I guess, and uh, so I learned all the uh, old, old, uh, old ways of doing things, which were the old traditional, you know, just hard, hard yakra, I guess, and lots of calls and 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 so forth. But the thing that was that was the thing that was great about it. But the hard real part part of it, I realised, was it was very much a product industry back then. And and you guys are quite fortunate to be joining an industry that I guess is now very much around service. Um, and I think to raise question around you know, ego, it, it's something that I recognised very early on in my career that uh, we, we have been, you know, we, we were trained uh, and still are continued to train to do a whole bunch of things that truly are not part of our value proposition uh, and that uh, actually detract from our, our clients and our business. And, and uh, it's, it started from a position of, you know, the premise that I could pick the next winning fund or share um, to to the next best winning fund or the next best winning asset allocation or the next best winning investment. Um, and I thought that's why I joined the industry. And what I realized is that the stuff that I was spending most of my time on was actually adding zero value. Um, and which, which, you know, which was, you know, I guess something we can explore further, right? Yeah. So I'll jump in and, and keep going. I don't know what's going on with Ray's internet. We'll, we'll try and sort that out. But, um, so we're talking about investments and, and advisors, um, you know, doing the investment recommendations. Um, you know, should advisors be, you know, looking at recommending investments for clients? Yes and no. So no, the, what drove me nuts, uh, and the only way I can use that word is nuts or politely insane, was the concept of delivering advice you know, by around investments one by one, where every advisor would be literally doing it review by review, 
ROA by ROA, SOA by SOA, or back in my days, AOSOA, which was an additional statement of advice. We didn't have ROAs. Uh, and the concept that we, that process actually added any value. Um, and so, I, as Ray mentioned, you know, and some of you know, I've you know, constant, consistently travelled overseas to try and work out what the best were doing. And I very, very quickly worked out that the best practices really had no ego around investment philosophy. Their ego sat around their ability to scale their business up. So technology enablement, how well could I grow my business? And that the investment philosophy was kind of six or seven. And it didn't really matter if it was dynamic asset allocation or strategic asset allocation or ETFs and managed funds or direct shares. And to be honest, guys, it was all bullshit. It what really mattered was that we delivered it in such a way that it highly engaged the client. Because the th concept that I had and the way I was trained and some of you will have been trained is that you, me, I, the next 100 advisors or 1,000 advisors in this country can actually pick the next winning investment and we are truly going to be able to outperform investments over time. We can't, right? That is the one thing we have no control over, but everything else we do. We control everything else on the client experience. So what I realised and what made me create implemented the portfolio is at least, you know, inter internally now nine years ago was that the key to a successful advice business was going to be scale. The key was going to be winning the excellence in the client experience. The key, key was going to be the technology enablement, which would drive profitability, which would allow me to... Um, but the investment philosophy piece, and I, I have had this wrong many times over my career for what it's worth, doesn't matter. So whatever your religion is, do it, but do it scalably. So do you, so do you think as advisors, we, it, what I'm hearing out of that is we should maybe move to just passive investments, just, you know, set an asset allocation and then move to, you know, ETFs or index funds. Is that is that kind of what you, you think is we should do as advisors? Again, my, my religion is that, but that, that doesn't mean your religion should be that. My point, I guess, is, you know, we, yes, we should drive down the cost to the climb. I think we're all going to agree on that. And why pay for a whole bunch of active management that doesn't work? I mean, some of you would have heard me say this, and, and it probably offends some of you, but the reality is, you know, the active managed fund is the greatest investment failure of all time. You cannot find a bigger investment failure. And there's no research to suggest that active managed funds over long term outperform and you pay all these high costs and you get this credible tax inefficiency and you have no control, no transparency. You kind of cross your fingers, hope the diet does well. So, you know, but again, it's not my job to tell with, you know, anyone that that doesn't work. If advisors think that does, then fantastic. Where my passion lies is that It can't be delivered by pen, paper and people. It has to be technology enabled. It has to be scalable processes. The thing that takes the most time in an advice business is delivery of the investment piece. It's the review preparation. We're going to switch fund X to fund Y, asset allocation X to Y. Whatever it may be, that stuff takes a whole bunch of time for absolutely zero value. And so how can we enable that via technology and therefore get the benefits of being able to now to engage that client and then really focus on the one thing that was that, 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 that true ability to care about the client and help them have an amazing journey. So... Santi, if a lot of advisors have built up their practice on this, uh, I'm going to charge you for investment advice. They've got, a, you know, they're charging a farm or even a, you know, a fee for service, but the value proposition is around uh, investment advice. How do they then transition their business from uh, I am the one giving you investment advice, charging you for investment advice, to saying, actually, I don't believe I can add enough value in this area. Uh, how do they do that without losing their whole business? Well, it's actually not a big... So I actually asked that question to an American some years ago and the answer was quite offensive. You know, his bluntness was like, crap, he did it. And I said, mate, I'm about to do this in my business. I'm about to switch from actually doing it all in-house to partnering with a team out-house. 
I'm having these whole, whole butterflies and I'm scared shitless advisors are going to see, clients are going to see through me and they're going to say, what do you actually do? And his response was just brutal in its honesty, which was, don't worry, Santi, they don't think you can outperform, they like you. <laughs> and I went, you know what, you're bloody right. It's never been about that. It's never been about picking the next winning investment. It's got to be done bloody well. It has to be, in my mind, done the best. The asset allocation has to be done either dynamically or strategically, but done without the need of pen and paper and people. So the quarterly rebalancing or whatever it may be. The models and investment portfolios need to be delivered to the client and communicated to the client without the, you know, that's the way the ROA, the advisor or this power planner or the client service team getting in the middle. It's got to be done bloody well, but it has nothing to do with, you know, if I'm picking the next winning ETF, for example, or I'm changing asset allocation, so what? If I'm partnering with someone who delivers that for me and they're my team, so what? If the client doesn't care. And it's never been about it. And I guess to Ray's point, it's why the ego to check at the door was the biggest thing I realised. It actually makes no difference if I do it or someone else does it. It's just got to be done bloody well. Not the ghost. So, sorry, can you hear me now? Am I okay? Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. So if you're leaving um, or if you're taking the investment piece off the table, what like, I suppose, and, and this, this probably talks to some of your learnings as you've done those trips around the world, what's, what's the advisor doing? Where's, where's the value they're delivering? Uh, what, well, what value do they deliver to their clients then? Yeah, I mean, genuinely everyone, you, your advisors know this better than, you know, I guess my, my peers, I think, know it, but the older industry don't. Uh, it, all the value sits in the human connection and relationship. Full stop. And clients all over the world, that businesses all over the world that I've met who tell me about their successes and I hear how and I look at their business and I realise their success have worked out all the value in the human connection and the relationship. It has nothing to do with the investment. Again, my point around the religious fear that you meet when you meet advisors who are, you know, so strong about investments that, oh, we want to do it this way, we want to do it. It just doesn't matter. And I haven't met a business around the world that is successful where they think that does matter. The ones that are truly successful have worked out that all the value sits in that, that the clients will pay for that relationship and that trust um, because they really treasure that. That, that and, you, and you guys have been, you know, I've been a big part of this journey with you guys and trying to unlock the fact that, you know, your roles are changing as advisors um, from one of managing product to one of managing a system, and that system is going to be incredible at gauging our clients. And is it, is it your sense that in Australia where we're sitting um, you know, perhaps behind the times relative to our global peers or are we in front, uh, you know, compared to what you're, what you're seeing in the States? I think this peer group is, is probably equal to or ahead of, of what's occurring around the world, but as a broad comment, I'd say we're behind. Uh, we are tremendously inefficient business primarily not our fault the licensees have done everything they can to make sure it's been product first and service last um, and that's got to change and it is changing as the industry moves independent and we're having great support of the likes of you know uh, the IFA but also regulators who are who are helping this industry have a voice and, and letting us pour independence fight um, for better outcomes for clients uh, so that's, you know, that, that's, we're catching up rapidly. But if you came with me in one of my countless trips to the US and we walked into 30 businesses, you would see 30 businesses that do not deliver advice and investment management the way we do in this country. Okay. And I mean, without, without sort of getting into a, an in, institution uh, conversation with the industry, is it, you know, do, is it your sense that that, I mean, is, that, that's, that's just inherently different in the United States, isn't it? It's, um, I mean, there's a different climate, so you, the advisor walks in in a totally different context to what's, what's, what's here. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, it is fair. Um, right, I mean, it's, the, 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 the clients are very much the same. You know, they, there's no difference in the clients. Uh, we have a, the big difference is, is you've got a thriving independent market versus a emerging, you know, some uh, a, a head of a very, very, very large institution, and I can't say his name because he's that big, 
over at dinner with me once in New York, um, Manhattan said to me, Sandy, we won't enter the Australian market until there's a thriving independent market. Right now, the institutions control it, so why would we invest in it? Now, I know what they do in the US, and I'm in awe of it. And I'm like, God, imagine being able to have that technology back here, but we can't get it because we haven't had a thriving independent market. Now, we're getting it, um, and we're seeing technology providers, some of your previous presenters, come on and really change this game, which is great. There's a question too, Ray, that I noticed came up, which is a really fantastic question. Uh, Shane, sorry to put you on the spot. You know, how do we get around uh, comparing portfolios where the client says, well, X did seven, why did we do five? Um, and, you know, it's something that I guess, you know, probably raised better than this to me, to be honest. But ultimately, um, we have been trained to compare to benchmarks. We have trained the clients to compare to benchmarks. And if the clients want us, if the clients are asking us to be position our value around a benchmark and the client is actually asking exactly the wrong question and it's incumbent upon us to be able to go you know what we don't care about the benchmark your benchmark is you achieving your goals and if we're on track to achieve them then we're doing our job you want me to compete against last year's best performance uh i guarantee over long term we will lose do you think um, perhaps there's a, there's a piece then around client education and, and perhaps having clients in the right headspace around, you know, understanding that, you know, um, and, and being being comfortable, you know, being at the barbecue with their mates and saying, yeah, industry done, fund did seven, I did five, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, it's, we've got to educate the advisors first to have the confidence to say you're asking me to do exactly the wrong thing. You want me to chase performance, I guarantee. I can sell you the next best product every day of the week, Mr. and Mrs. Client, but do you really want that? Do you really want me to compete against the best next best performance or do you really want me to compete about the next best service and making sure you achieve your goals and objectives? But that or any client, any client will say, no, no, well, I don't want you to sell me stuff. I, okay, yeah, I get it, right? Um, and trying to trying to manage performance versus uh, an index over one year, you know, it's an outright mugs game and, 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 and any client that's asking us to do that is asking us to do exactly the wrong thing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, part, part, part of the, the, the piece for advisors perhaps is equipping themselves and correct me if I'm wrong, to be able to have really brilliant conversations around Around you know longevity and the like, and 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 perhaps putting putting those numbers in in the right context, as you were saying. So around objectives, not 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 relative to to industry fund A or B or whatever it is. You know, do you have any thoughts around you know tools that advisors have or or framing of conversations and, and those sorts of things? Oh, mate. Unfortunately, it goes to my, my I guess that negative comment I made around that industry, that executive in the US. Look, it's, it's coming. I'm watching it come happen everywhere. We're working on it. How can we enable advisors to actually focus on the true, you know, the true alpha, which is those that values and goals and objectives? How can we help our advisors, clients have better lives? Um, we've been, you know, one thing Implementer did, uh, I guess, you know, remember I built Implementer for myself before we started talking to other advisors. We never built it to sell. We built it to fix the problem of how we could truly engage the client in a mass customized way via technology around investments. Now we're spending all our time thinking about how we can engage the client around the advice piece in a mass customized way where we can truly help them have better lives and achieve their goals, but it can't be delivered by pen and paper. It's got to be technology enabled. So you know, we, we haven't stopped thinking about those type of things because if, if I'm right and, you know, and, and what I've been learning from some of the best in the US over the last few years is right, then we are, our role is fundamentally changing the managing a system. And that system will be brilliant at servicing our clients. And we'll be the human face of that technology. And we'll be able to service significantly more clients and be great, significantly more profitable and have significantly better lives because nothing else that gets in the way will stop us. The product guys, everything will disappear out of our value chain. Um, and look, you know, Andrew asked a good question too about building investment philosophy. Um, you know, there's heaps of people out there, uh, Andrea, that will help you through that. Um, and 
help you define that, whatever it is. Um, and I you know, reach out to Ray and I'm sure he could ask me and I'll contact with some organisations that do that as their business. Um, but then the key bit is it's got to be delivered scalably by technology and the pen and paper must disappear. And that is a sense then perhaps that that's, that's the wave that we're, we're waiting on in Australia. You know, I, I see a lot of advisors and they, they kind of get it and they're, they're trying to not necessarily separate the advice piece but certainly have a, have a holistic uh, proposition to clients, certainly around health and wellness and, and, and the like. Um, though perhaps I think, you know, a big part of it is you, you, it's, it's, a, it's tricky to, to make money out of that type of model because there's no scale. Um, you know, you can only you can only do that for so many people as a as an advisor um, because you know my sense is that technology isn't isn't quite there yet. You know, would it, would it be a fair comment to say that that technology is is, is on its way? Yeah, mate, it is. It's, it's here. So the opportunity for every one of your listeners to to deliver mass customized solutions via technology, it's here. That's uh, what we do. It's what others do. Uh, the ability to build um, client experiences around their values and goals and their objectives is coming in a big way. Um, and within three or four years, we'll all be doing it. Um, I think uh, the I think Mark's asked an interesting question too. I think the point is, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that actually investments don't matter. Um, if we all took a 10 year view and we built a portfolio of Vanguard, BlackRock, or some active fund portfolios, uh, whatever, um, direct share portfolios, we're probably all gonna get about one to 2% difference over that 10 years. It's gonna mean bugger all to our clients from a position of helping them achieve their goals and objectives. So if we can't add value around that, then it's just gotta be done brilliantly. Forget about an ex-best fund manager, just deliver it brilliantly. Uh, and get on a focusing where your alpha really lies, um, which is that that human connection and helping the clients for a better journey. I think there's some uh, content uh, Vanguard put puts out around the advisor alpha piece. Uh, talking back to, uh, I, I believe it was Andrea's question. Um, there's some interesting sort of discussion papers that they did around you know, the, the, the true value of advice and advisor alpha. So, Andrew, if you're, you mind to have a look at that stuff, it's, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty wonderful. So, um, Sandy, sorry, you going? Mate, I was just trying to knock off some of these questions if I could help you guys, but, yeah, you, you let me know. Yeah, I, I've got some questions for myself and then we'll go to the audience questions. So uh, feel free to keep throwing them out um, and we'll get to them. But I've got a question. So I, I listened to this webinar and I'm like, you know, Santa is the bomb. I love it. I, my value is not around investment advice anymore. Uh, we talk about getting rid of, you know, ROAs for investments. Love it. How do we do it? Feel free to give implemented portfolios a plug because I really don't know what you guys do. So uh, explain how you do it, but how do we get rid of the ROAs, SOAs in investment advice? Well, really, really simple. So, uh, and unfortunately, uh, I am conflicted, but hopefully people can see through it, noting that I built this to fix my own problems, not, not be necessarily talking to your advisors. Um, you know what effectively all we do is we worked out two things right two things and we looked at it from a context of what we are crap at right um we are really crap at delivering mass customized solutions it was one by one pen and paper review by review switch this switch that asset allocations out of weight crap stuff that was just annoying right we all we wanted to do is sit there and talk about the client and their goals and their objectives and here we are spending five hours to prepare this report. So we decided to fix the mass customization piece. How could we buy technology, treat every client individually at every level? Tax, implementation, remodeling, stock, asset, parcel, anything that they could possibly matter. A true IMA, right? Not just what some of the other people are shoveling around at the moment. So how could we fix that? We then said, what else are we really crap at? Well, we're really crap at doing asset allocation, dynamically or strategically. We don't have a process around asset allocation dynamically. And even if we wanted to just quarterly rebalance to a strategic asset allocation, that requires a whole bunch of paperwork and, and stuff, right? You guys know it better than I do. 
How could we fix that? And then how could we fix the implementation of models? So we don't want to be picking the next winning share or ETF or fund. How could we just get that delivered well in a way where the clients control it? And there's a question that relates to this too. That's what we built. We fixed the mass customization bit. We fixed what we did badly. Asset allocation, be it dynamic or strategic, and the implementation of model portfolios. Um, and so that's all we do. Now, the practices around the country that use us, some of which are on this call, um, are simply just white label our service. So they white label our technology and our infrastructure and deliver it as their own. So we're kind of, we like to think of ourselves as a cool phrase as the IP inside, Intel inside white label our service and then they either white label our investment programs that we built and our asset allocation services that we built or they create their own on our technology. Okay. So if, if I'm a new advisor walking in and saying, uh, sounds good. Uh, how, how is it actually structured? I, you guys have model portfolios or, um, yeah, our models or their models is effectively how we deliver it. And you're running it in a, a, under a, like an IMA, is that? Yeah, it's an IMA. So again, a bastardised term in the marketplace, but you know, and we're seeing this shift to, I guess, SMAs. Um, and I want to be very clear to the industry that that's a big, very, very dangerous shift. Um, and I have learnt, I've learned this mistake firsthand. If anyone else asked me about how I did it, but we we did bugger it up big time ten years ago. Um, but the industry shifting from picking managed funds or direct shares like I used to to picking SMAs is not a value proposition. I've shifted my business model from picking a managed fund to a transparent managed fund. So what? How does it help the business? And I would argue strongly it doesn't. In fact, it damages the business. The IMA piece is about how can we, and it's again in the, one of these questions here, I can't remember who, uh, about how can we mass customise? How can we treat clients individually for implementation, remodelling, tax, you know, instead of you, the advisor, having to sit there and go, what is the tax on this client before we make this suggestion to switch this asset allocation and now that fund is no longer on the APL and we've got to switch that fund and what's the tax consequences of that? There's zero value. We just do it. Remembering the fact, the fact that the client doesn't want to sell that asset for 12 months because they want to maximise the CUP discount. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So my next question is more around these US trips. You're doing them once a year, I understand. What's the point? Why do you go to the US? Uh, mate, it's a really simple, and I'd love you all to come with me. Um, if you could think about professional education and all of you are running businesses, spending one week a year thinking about yourself and thinking about your business and what listening to the best and being in the opposite time zone so your Wi-Fi is out and everyone's asleep and no one's emailing you and you're with a bunch of peers who are all with exactly the same objective. Uh, I often think about it as in the context selfishly of how could I, whenever I'm there, I want to make a million bucks, right? In my mind, that's the way I think about it. Where's the million dollar idea that I can make by being, putting a weaker side of my life and leaving my family and so forth like that. And that's why I do it because the, the things we learn and share and experience and, and delve into our weaknesses and share all these kinds of experiences are just so beneficial to my career. Hmm. And is it aimed mainly for those advisors who are um, heavily in the investment space or is it any financial or other? Um, in fact, me almost completely the opposite. So if anyone wants to talk to us about how good they are picking next win investment, no. Yes. Anyone wants to talk about, you know, uh, anything that's, you know, economics, no. Um, you're not allowed. You know, anyone who wants to talk about a better way to, way to run businesses, hey, come on in. We want to hear. Listen, you know, tell us what you know and share those ideas. Yeah, awesome. Uh, and so my, my last one that did dovetail into Shane's question about, you know, clients discussing, you know, X um, fund has gone 7%, but now my portfolio is only 5%. Um, how do we... So Shane did ask, you know, how do we deal with that? But also that's what clients are hearing. The market's telling clients that self-managed super funds are on TV all day, every day saying that, you know, our fund performed X percent in the last 10 years. They pick a time frame that suits best for their advertising campaign. Um, so the marketing towards our clients is all about returns, uh, always is very much about returns. So how do we as advisors combat that? Look, I'll give my best 
Ants, I mean, I'd argue probably Ray's better at this one than me and his colleagues. Um, but ultimately, it's going to take you to have a tremendous amount of courage to say good or bad. It doesn't matter. Hey, we outperformed this year. But letting you know that is not how we want you to think about your investments. And if anyone is encouraging you to think like that, they're actually forcing you to make the wrong decision. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Santi. I've got, I've got a question here. Uh, it's perhaps a, a practical one. So if you're an advisor and, uh, you know, you've got, got yourself a, a good little business running and, and you, you, you sort of see the light, so to speak, and, and you understand that you want to change the way that you do things, the transition of the licensees is, is, is proving difficult. Is there a particular process or a particular, you know, way that you've seen advisors be really efficient in transitioning to minimise the disruption you know, with their clients and business operations and the like to, uh, yeah, to, to, to be in, a, I guess, a liberated structure. So we're we talking about licensing or business processes or both? Lice or both, but the, the, so the question was based around licensing, but, uh, but perhaps both. Okay, well, I might return it back to you as, as the best way uh, I've experienced it said to me. When I explain the licensing model to anyone who's not an Australian, they look at you like an idiot. So let me understand, Santi. You've decided to create a business. You take all the risk, and now you're actually personally on the line as an advisor. You are all head of sales, marketing, technology, communication. You're head of strategy. You're head of client review. You're doing all this stuff, and someone else tells you what to do with your business? Are you guys nuts? Like, are you utterly insane? It's, and if you think about it in this context, the way we build our businesses where someone else can dictate to us how we run it and the technology we use, especially in this today's environment, it is utterly nuts. So my very strong view based on, on the, my experiences, and hey, guys, I was in the independent space in the first dozen years of my career. My business partner unfortunately passed away and we sold his shares to a wonderful organisation called Genesis who's no longer around, thank God. And they sold their soul away in pee. And we sat, we, we sat there and got treated like crap by them. Now, that has to end, right? The fact that we, you know, we're now an independent advice business. I didn't probably say I still own an advice business. I'm not an advisor. We got to have control our technology and our services and the way we deliver our businesses. And, and I guess there's part of a question that was raised here about you know, the licensing model, and some don't allow us to use implemented and so forth. You know, licensees having control over how you operate a business is simply not on, in my opinion, and you need to take control. And, um, and, and the only way to do that is have your own license. And ultimately, you're the one in business and you're the one taking all the risks. So you should be the one that um, has control over your life. Well, Santi, it's good that you've held back here your, your, um, for this interview. Um, you're really quiet and reserved, um, which is great to see. <laughs> so last, last audience question uh, from Mark Rottenstein. He's, he's kind of asked about, you know, the new way of doing business, um, you know, training, you do CFP and they teach you, you know, your ethics and they teach you kind of the hardcore strategy stuff. But, you know, that new way of doing business, we're moving away from I'm the investment guy or I'm your insurance guy to being more holistic, looking at things like cash flow. Um, it, it, how do we, and you also mentioned licensing, how do we make those huge, you know, fundamental shifts in the industry um, such as licensing, such as training, such as moving away from product focused advice? Oh, mate, it's a, it's a frustrating one, that one, isn't it? Look, ultimately, what we want doesn't exist right now. There is not, a, there is not a, an industry association, association out there that cares about the things you just said. Uh, so ultimately, maybe we've got to create an industry association, guys, you know, that actually does do things that matter. Uh, the CFP program could not be more out of date. Uh, why do we need to learn about modern portfolio theory and and all this stuff that truly doesn't add a cent of value to our clients, you know, journey. Um, there's a, a piece of research from the Rydell Institute in the US and they had 300 clients who had, a, had been an advisor, who, sorry, had been a client of advisor for more than 20 years, right, 20 years. And they asked these people a whole bunch of loaded questions. They didn't know where that was heading. 
that effectively 93% of these 300 clients said that the biggest value their advisor had made for them over their career, that 20 year career with the client was the turning points in their life. It was when I had to get a new job, when I got married, when I got divorced, when I had children, when I had to move state. The client said the things that truly added value to me were those turning points in my life and my advisor being able to help me through that. Now that we're not going to teach in a CFP. That's innate in you, right? And if it's not innate in you, you're probably in the wrong business. Mm. Um, 7% said it had something to do with money. And I, maybe that goes to the performance question before. It actually just doesn't matter because we're all going to perform the same over 10 years. So we might as well just do it bloody well and get on about doing what we're great at, which is that human connection and relationship. Um, but I haven't got the solution of that. I wish I had the time and energy to salute, to create it, but I think you guys do. And, you know, maybe there's a business model there. Well, that, that's a perfect way to finish up, talking about, you know, our true value as advisors. Um, and it's good to see, um, you know, that, that we're starting to talk about, you know, what our real value is. So I just want to thank you again, Santi, uh, for coming on and, and sharing with us, you know, what we do and, and how we should think about investment advice in the future. So just to close off, I just want to thank AIA for um, being able to help us bring uh, weekly XY Lives um, and also get on the Facebook group. Um, if you haven't already signed up and you're not already in there, um, make sure you get on that. Uh, we'll put a link in the chat area. Uh, and also one last thing. Oh, Santi, can we, that research paper you just mentioned then, are you able to track that down for us and put it on the Facebook group? Of course, I'll get that sorted. That would be fantastic. All right, thank you very much, Santi, and thanks, Ray. And guys, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Santi. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.